Hello, everyone. We are coming to you from the 2025 Reuters Global Energy Transition Conference. My name is Shenando Basu, Director of Energy Technology and Innovation at the Rockefeller Foundation. And today we are joined by none other than Lee Courier, founder and CEO of NextGen Energy. Welcome, Lee. Thank you for having me. Yeah, very good, very good. So let's jump right into it. The uranium market is getting a lot of interest. It's really experiencing a resurgence. Why don't you tell us about what NextGen Energy is doing to capture that? Yeah, you, you, you're quite right. Uh, world uh, economies are committing to nuclear energy and I've been in the sector for over 23 years and I've never seen a uh, environment where the adaption, uh, adoption of nuclear energy worldwide is so, uh, so embraced. And yeah, having been in the sector for as long as I have, it's really pleasing to see that this policy is based on scientific fact uh, as opposed to some of the false ideologies that had inhibited the development of nuclear energy in the past. Next Gen Energy, we are developing what will be the world's most technically and environmentally elite uh, resources project and uh, supplying approximately 20% of the world's uranium supply when in production. And to put that into context, Saudi Arabia currently produce and, and deliver 9% of the world's oil. So, you know, to be a 20% producer of what is going to be such a key uh, component of the world's energy policy, uh, comes with great responsibility and I'm just one member of a, a far broader team that are, are highly dedicated and committed to uh, delivering this, this project. Um, our fuel, to put 20% of the world's production in perspective, will power approximately 46 million homes. Now that's the equivalent of the, every home in the five most populous states in the US. So um, incredible project, uh, incredible team. Um, behind the scenes that are, are highly dedicated to delivering this um, uh, like material project worldwide. Yeah, certainly sounds like it. And 20% is, is quite a bit of market power. So uh, really fantastic to hear that. So talk, speaking about markets, right, uh, it seems that there's a bit of a disconnect between the fundamentals of what's going on right now in the uranium markets uh, versus the equities. Uh, that are associated with them. Maybe we can get into that a bit. Yeah, sure. And and look, that's historically been the case where the the commodity price um, is always lagging what the fundamentals are that are unfolding. But but what we've seen in history as well is that when it really bites, um, the price of uranium accelerates very very quickly. Um, it, the the spot market is thinly traded at times. Uh, a lot of the uh, uh, contracting is, is off market and, and uh, directly between utilities and producers and then when uh, the, the utilities don't get their fill they go into the spot market and then you see the real demand come in um, and, and the price transparency and we're seeing that right at the moment and the uranium price is moving up um, uh, it's about double what it was uh, 18 months ago um, but needs to go considerably higher uh, the US consume 50 million pounds per annum, produce less than one uh, domestically, and, and the cost profile of those uh, deposits require far higher prices, north of, way north of $100 um, US, and currently the price is at 78. Um, but when the price got to $136 back in the early 2000s, uh, which is the equivalent of $210 US today, a lot of those projects in the US didn't even um, commence construction, which really does convey their economics. You know, the, the, the US is going to need prices far in excess of $200 to see material production um, from its uh, domestic resources. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Now, I think the economics certainly tie into the sorts of resources that you have access to, right? And, and Rook One is sort of regarded as the, the crown jewel from a nuclear fuel standpoint in Canada, right? So. How is NextGen preparing to um, take full advantage of that resource and, and transition from, from permitting to construction to ultimately production? Yeah, look, you're 100% correct. Uh, the Rook One project, uh, underpinned by the Arrow resource, is considered for a, a project over 100 million pounds, which is really the very highest hurdle globally. If you've got a project over 100 million pounds, you're in an elite category but it is the, the number one project in that category. So the, the best project in the world from a size, grade and, and technical setting. And with that, 
it, it really is an economic phenom of a resources project, one of the best worldwide across any commodity. It's got an exceptionally uh, fast payback period. Um, and, and when in production, as I said, 20% of the world's supply. And for, for next gen, we've had a very deliberate contracting strategy to, uh, and it speaks to your earlier point, there's, there's often a disconnect between the spot price uh, and the market. And um, we are uh, a deliberate strategy to keep exposed to the future price of uranium at the time of delivery. And so our contracts are structured in that manner and it is a bit of a changing or, or a shift from what has traditionally been done in the past between uh, producers and, and utilities that have had like upwards of a, a decade long contract for a fixed amount. Um, and, uh, and so what we're providing is greater uh, certainty and greater flexibility for the utilities and, and I think that's in the interests of both uh, us as a producer and, and the utility. Right, right. And, and as a producer, you've been very active in Patterson cor Corridor East, right, the PCE region. So how does that fit into your strategy and, and what does it mean for uh, your long-term growth potential? Yeah, well, we are developing what is considered the world's number one deposit. We found it with the very, or, or one of the very first drill holes on the property back in uh, February of 2014. We recommenced exploration last year, considering you know we've, we've, we're well advanced on the engineering uh, for the Rook One project, and uh, we made our second discovery uh, in PCE. And and uh, to put it into context, if we look at what Arrow looked like after the same amount of meters drilled um, currently at PCE, PCE is looking even more exciting than what Arrow is, and so. Um, as that evolves and, and, and turning into what we highly suspect or, or at or near Arrow, maybe even bigger, um, we will then undertake the, the studies in order to maybe even increase production, uh, obviously subject to a subsequent appro uh, permitting approval, but even increase production because Arrow at, at 30 million pounds per annum isn't even going to replace the current production that is coming offline between now and 2030. So the world needs not just one arrow, it actually needs multiple arrows. And there's, a, there's less than a handful of dedicated uranium companies who have been operating over the last decade. You know, there's ourselves, Denison, uh, Boss, um, that have been fully invested in the development of uranium projects uh, since you know, the, the early 2000s. And so, um, it, it's very important that all of these projects do get into uh, production to meet this surging demand. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that is critical to your success. I, I do see that. Let's shift gears just a little bit. Um, I want to kind of look at um, what you're doing through a global perspective, right? So given the evolving geopolitical landscape, um, the US and the EU are, are really working to phase out of Russian supply. Uh, and by the way, um, I have to say this being at RF, or at the Rockefeller Foundation, many emerging market countries now, middle income, low income countries, are looking to solidify their nuclear strategies as well, right, over the next 10 or 15 years potentially, right? So how are these, in your view, how are these countries going to be maybe able to rely on companies like NextGen in the future for their trade agreements, fuel supply needs, and things like that? Yeah, it, it's a really good question, and, and it's often an, an aspect that's overlooked, that the, the sovereign profile or the sovereign risk around the current world supply is heavily uh, um, subject to Russia and, and Russian-influenced countries such as Kazakhstan. Last year, the US imported 45% of their nuclear fuel from Russia. And now we've seen the legislation uh, that will be uh, banned in 2028 in the US. And, and then we've recently seen, just last week, uh, Niger nationalized the uh, uranium mines off uh, the French. Uh, and so that was servicing 25% of the uh, French um, supply of nuclear fuel, and now that's gone. And so if you are a project located in the US, Canada or Australia, you, you have very strong sovereign profile to where utilities anywhere around the world will be able to rely on that supply. Right. And, and so I, I see there's gonna, uh, it'll evolve that there's a bit of a premium or, or 
bifurcation of um, uranium sourced from Canada, Austra uh, US and Australia, um, and then other parts of the world where the sovereign risk is higher. Right. So, um, you know, me personally, I can accept mining risk and challenge, but not sovereign risk. I, it's just not in my disposition. Um, but it, it, it's a key aspect which I think is overlooked. I think there's been a perception out there that there's an endless supply of uranium. It, it, it actually is, uh, the current supply is, is under significant sovereign risk. Yeah, yeah, no, certainly, certainly sounds like it. Um, Speaking of, let, let's double click a little bit on, on the uh, supply chain piece of this, right? So when it comes to contracting and market exposure and, and sort of balancing some flexibility with that, right? What has the response from utilities been so far to you and, and how does that um, translate over to your, how you're thinking about strategy? Yeah, um, we've had a lot of utility visits up to our uh, project uh, over the last two years. It's, it's very fair to say that the negotiations between us and the utilities have accelerated. Uh, we actually signed our first three offtake agreements in uh, December of 2024. And we are currently in various stages of negotiation with utilities in the US, uh, uh, Europe, and, and Asia and Japan, which may surprise some people. Um, but Japan is, is also very active in uh, the re-procurement of uh, nuclear fuel as they're going to be turning their reactors back on because they just don't have a choice um, with respect to um, energy. They, they need to import everything energy-wise and, uh, and the, the consumption of energy is rising uh, in Japan and worldwide, in fact. So um, incredibly exciting time for the, for the sector. Yeah, yeah, and, and you're at the forefront of it, which, which is fantastic, right? Um, so seeing as you've had quite a bit of success, uh, especially with dealing with the Canadian government around permitting and things like that, how do you maybe see yourself as a paradigm um, for the industry, and, and how might that success be replicated um, for other project approvals going down, going forward? Yeah, look, I, I would say a large factor in our success has been our experience prior to um, next gen. Everyone involved in the company has had uh, very good experience in every facet of getting a mine into production. And uh, we purposely, we like the regulatory oversight. Um, you know, we, our values are about elite environmental and, and social standards. And, um, and so we understand the regulatory process well, we respect it. Um, and yeah, every permitting process, um, both the company and the regulator learn, you know, new aspects. And I think, in some degree, our experience has has paved um, perhaps a um, smoother road going forward for subsequent companies who are who who are going to seek um, permitting. Look, it it is a very uh, involved, highly complex process covering technical, environmental, and social aspects, and it should be rigorously tested, and the standards should be very high. And um, we have met that, and uh, yeah, as I said, we, as a company, uh, we take enormous pride in doing what we do well, and if that uh, assists subsequent companies um, uh, as well, well, that's, that's excellent. Yeah, because the world needs not just our project. I mentioned earlier, it needs the Denisons, the Boss Energies, uh, also to come online. And and Boss Energy is down in down in Australia, where I'm originally from. Uh, but Denison's also doing excellent work uh, on the permitting front, and uh, yeah, we we look forward to them being successful also. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like uh, environmental uh, responsibility is sort of a, and almost a requirement for this industry going forward, right? Uh, at yeah. Absolute um, uh, minimum. Yeah. Uh, you you not, not only meet, but exceed right, uh, right. the standards. So before we close things out, why don't you tell us what will um, stakeholders be looking for maybe by the end of this year, as we had also towards the end of the decade? Uh, what are some things they should look forward to coming out of next gen? Yeah, f f first of all, you know, the, the uranium price, I think you're going to see continue to rise. Uh, you'll also see additional offtake 
um, agreements uh, announced between NextGen and, and uh, utilities in the US. Um, also the project, uh, ongoing uh, exploration at PCE. Like we, it is an incredibly exciting uh, drilling program that we've got currently uh, as we speak. Uh, and then uh, we are getting ready for the, the final commission hearings. Um, and we enjoy you know, support from every stakeholder uh, that is impacted by the project. And, and uh, we look forward to that concluding. And then after that, uh, getting into construction. And the project's going to um, uh, employ around 2,600 2, people. Um, and so it's a, it's a big deal for the province of Saskatchewan and Canada. And you know, we're working on a project that will power 46 million homes annually um, with uh, in a carbon-free uh, environment. So um, incredible responsibility, and uh, we take that at NextGen incredibly seriously, and we're highly dedicated to delivering that. Yeah, yeah, a lot to look forward to. Well, Lee, thank you so much again for thank joining. You. And coming to you again from the 2025 Reuters Global Energy Transition Conference, I'm Shananda Basu signing off.